Welcome to CC, the classic car show. In this episode, we go for a ride in a spider, and not the creepy type. Also on the show, how to choose a classic car. We get behind the wheel of what is considered Britain's most beautiful car ever built. And it goes fast too. And some custom classics that are real head turners. Plus, a sports classic of tomorrow with quite the pedigree. And we test your classic car memory in Know Your Chrome. So relax in a comfortable chair, put your feet up and enjoy CC Classic Cars. We've talked about the period from the late 60s to the early 70s, when Alfa Romeo was a shining example of Italian design and manufacturing. And there is no better example of this success than the very likeable, sporty little roadster, the Alfa Romeo Spider. This car is a 1974 Alfa Romeo Spider Veloci. The Veloci indicates that it carries the two litre twin cam engine, um, one of the many variants that uh, Alfa have used for several decades. It was quite popular at the time, at the time and uh, was used in one or two films. I think uh, The Graduate featured a, a red Alfa Spider Veloci, uh, which the red being of course the uh, preferred colour for most Italian cars. The Spider was based on the brilliant performer, the Giulia 105. First shown at the Turin Motor Show in 1961 as the Duetta, the car did not go into production until 1965, with the first completed Spiders available for sale in 1966. The Alfa Romeo Spider was built over three decades, from 1966 to 1993, with the Veloci built from 1971 to 1989. Not a rare car, more than 100,000 Spiders rolled off the production line over the years, making them a favourite amongst classic car lovers. When I bought the car, I just sold a fairly rare French car and uh, the money was burning a hole in my pocket and I needed an open car in the garage so that uh, uh, we went along to a well-known well uh, provider of collectible cars and this was on his lot. And I'd always admired the Alfa mark. They've produced some marvellous cars in the past and uh, at times currently. And uh, that was on the lot and it suited my needs exactly. Like its classic coupe cousin, the 105 or Julia, the Spider is a good performer on the road and is a real driver's car, which went a long way to cement its popularity. Many say this design is the ultimate Alfa Romeo in terms of styling and the styling was done by Pininfarina, the famous Italian car design firm. In fact, the Spider was the last design founder of Pininfarina, Battista Farina was involved with. The Spider is one of his typical designs with the low bonnet line and uh, the enclosed headlamps um, and the typical Farina badge, of course, worn uh, on its flanks. Pininfarina was also responsible for the construction of the monocoque body of the car. The Spider was not only stylish, but safer to drive than many competing models, and some of the longevity of the model can be attributed to this fact. Other convertibles of the time were removed from the market as they failed to meet the ever-increasing strict US safety standards. The heart of the car, of course, is the, the engine, and it's a delight. It's a twin overhead camshaft uh, design. And the basic design has been uh, used by Alfa for a couple of decades, but uh, this is its ultimate version of two litres. They rev very freely, um, but of course you need to use the five-speed gearbox, um, but it seems to have tremendous urge in every gear, uh, so that you can get away from the lights pretty adequately. Um, you use the gearbox a lot around the mountains, and that's a delight because it's a, 
very smooth change and uh, uh, synchro mesh on all ratios. So how much will a little sporty Italian spider set you back? Well, not as much as you might think, as there were so many made, they're not too hard to find. Although the Veloci are a little thinner on the ground. There are more in the US and Europe, but can be a bit harder to find in other countries. A restored spider Veloci will cost you about 25,000 US, or 16,000 pounds. A good condition original, about 13,000 US, or 8,000 pounds. And an old clunker that runs on the road but needs a lot of TLC can be picked up for as little as 3,000 US or less than 2,000 pounds. So they're a classic that caters to most markets. I looked around uh, for quite a while and I was very fortunate that the car I'd, that I finally bought I had known in the previous ownership and uh, the then owner was very fastidious and he'd maintained the car very well so that when I got it there was very little to be done. Uh, and the whole car is a nice package. Um, you feel part of it as you drive. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Now your chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show. Some custom classics. A sporty classic of tomorrow. And this golden oldie from Jaguar. For everyone who owns a classic car, there are 10 more who would love to own one. But where do you start? Here's a few tips for people looking to get into the classic car market. There are many levels of classic car ownership, from the fellow who just kept his car for 40 years, right up to collectors of classic sports cars and rare builds. We keep saying it on this show, and it's true. You don't have to be rich to drive a classic, you just have to love classic cars. If you already have a classic in the family, that's a great place to start. For young lovers of classic motoring, it is often the first step into the world of classic cars. A classic car can be a great way for a young first-time car owner to learn about the ins and outs of a motor vehicle. The first job I did on the car was remove, removing the brakes. That meant taking off the brake drum, the brake shoes and the wheel cylinders. And then I took them to a place where they were reconditioned and then uh, when they came back, I put them all back on. Another option is to find a classic to restore yourself. Many classic car owners have lovingly restored their own classic and drive it with pride, and it doesn't get much better. There are pitfalls and hurdles and advantages. If you do go down this road, you need to find a car. And there are a couple of options. A barn find, an original, and of course, restored vehicles. A barn find is generally exactly that. It's something that's found in a property or an old barn. Uh, its condition may be good, but in most cases it's generally pretty poor because it's been used and in many cases abused. You have to remember these cars have probably gone through many hands before they've finally ended their days sitting in a barn. Barn finds are like treasure hunting, and it can be pretty exciting to discover a spectacular old car in need of your caring mechanical touch. Just don't leap without looking. Do your research or you could just be buying a pile of scrap to put in your own barn. Probably the most desirable and affordable classic cars are original vehicles. These are classics that have been kept and cared for their entire life and show minimal signs of wear and tear. There is no rule here. Some cars are daily drivers, while others may have been kept through retirement driven rarely. But astute buyers who take their time can pick up an original that many will assume is the result of a full restoration. And finally, a classic car can be purchased already restored. Many choose to let others do the hard work, and it can be a good idea. Often, classic car enthusiasts are driven by passion and the budget can be secondary. The result, the investment made in a restoration can and often will exceed the value of the project. The cost of restoration of classic cars is largely well beyond their market value. 
So it is not good sense to restore a classic car. It is certainly much more practical to buy a car that somebody else has restored and spend $100,000 on it, and you'll probably get it for half that price. The most important thing to remember when considering a classic, go with something you really love. It's one of the few times you can buy a car purely on passion. McLaren have been a powerhouse of motorsport for decades and their cars have dominated Formula One, having won 170 races, 12 drivers' championships and 8 constructors' championships. A car maker that knows what they are doing. So when a racing team goes out to produce a road car, we just know it's going to be a classic of tomorrow. McLaren sent Jensen Button and Lewis Hamilton to the test track to put the MP4 12C through its paces. Today we've brought two of our XP Beta prototype test cars to Goodwood. But we've also brought Jensen and Lewis along to have a drive. It's their first exposure to our work. At McLaren we're very fortunate to be able to draw on a huge amount of Formula One expertise and technology. But also uh, with Lewis and Jensen we've got two world champions helping with our test programme. It can't get better than that. First of all, you've got to remember, you've got to take your racing brain out, really, and put it to one side and remember that it is a road car. See, it's a nice car to drive, and it feels very quick as well. The great thing with this car is, uh, is, is the engine and, and also the downshifts. I feel really comfortable. Yeah, the turbo's kicking in. You can brake very late and deep. It's very responsive, you know. Change the direction. I have been involved with this project from the beginning. And when you're passionate about it, and then you see someone come along and uh, drive it quite quickly, yeah, it's an interesting feeling, but uh, you know, we've got to get used to it because we're going to sell a lot of these cars and have to get used to handing them over to owners and they can do what they want with them. Sounds good. MP412C, a surefire classic of tomorrow. Not every classic car is a restoration. Like anything in life, there are people who like to take a classic shape or style and customise it to create something different. Like this Triumph Le Mans, once a humble TR2, or this V8 MGB, once a slightly underpowered roadster. 
The ultimate classic car customization, though, is the classic hot rod, known as custom cars or customs. Just take a look at some of these classic cars with a new, more modern lease on life. Like this 1956 Chevrolet Sports Coupe. The car has been heavily modified, with the whole vehicle lowered, spectacular mag wheels, and even a custom engine bay, so the motor sits lower under the bonnet. And the motor, a 356 Chevy Motown, with two 600 DP Holly carbs and extractors. That's custom speak for tons of grunt under the hood. 550 horsepower to be exact. From its original state, the car was stripped, the rust was cut out, and new steel was welded in. The car was heavily modified to accommodate the wide wheels. The owner of this car spent well in excess of 80,000 US dollars on his project, but was offered twice that at the motor show we filmed the car at. It's not just sedans that get the custom treatment. Anything from bikes, utes and trucks can be worked on to become spectacular show cars. Of course, a custom job can go as far as you like. Some prefer to restore their classics to unique versions of fairly stock cars. This is a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air with minimal over-the-top body mods. Obviously lowered, the Bel Air still retains its classic lines from the factory. So, even artists can get into classic cars. Just call them custom cars. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away, or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC Classic Cars. A golden classic from a golden age and we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car. <laughs> One of the most coveted classic cars the world over is the Jaguar XKE, more commonly known as the Jaguar E-Type. Considered by many the most elegant car design to ever come out of Britain, the E-Type Jaguar came in three variations. The Grand Tourer Coupe, the 2 Plus 2, a longer wheelbase model with rear seats, and the spectacular drophead coupe, like this one here, owned by Helmut Leapy. Well, I've had the car now for about 25 years. I bought it in about 85, 86, and I was, prior to that, I owned a TR3A and a TR5. And then a friend of mine, he was a used car dealer at the time, and he had this Jaguar, fully restored Jaguar. And I thought, well, that's a nice car to have. And he said, oh yeah, you should get that. You should get rid of your Triumphs and buy this Jaguar. I thought, it sounds like a good idea. And at the time I thought, oh, I'll get rid of one of the Triumphs, the TR5, and I'll get the Jaguar. It was fully restored. Whereas prior to that, I'd restored the three and the five. They were quite nice cars. And, um, as it turned out, uh, I didn't want to sell any of the cars. So the question we had to ask was why, with a Triumph TR3 in the garage, did Helmut find himself buying another considerably pricey classic car? The TR3s give me as much fun as any other expensive classic car. But then I tried the Jaguar and that was really special. So um, it's, it's got all the modern conveniences, it's docile, uh, it's got heaps of performance for a car of that vintage. You know, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And also that it's a car that you can park next to a Ferrari, a Bentley. It's, it's a truly classic car, which fits into any category with the supercars, with those really expensive Italian cars. And it's, it's never out of place. The E-Type Jaguar was built between 1961 and 1975, and more than 70,000 vehicles rolled off the line over that period. There were three series of the car released, with various enhancements and changes over time. The most notable differences are of course engine capacity, with a 3.8 or 4.2 litre six-cylinder power plant as options in the Series 1 cars, right up to a 5.3 litre V12. At the time, Jaguar was still a major player in the supercar stakes, 
with the XK120 being the fastest production car ever built, barely a decade before the release of the XKE. What made the E-Type so popular was its performance as a road car. Uh, a friend of mine's got a Ferrari and an E-Type, and he said, I'd rather drive my E-Type. And this is a new Ferrari. It's just such a nice car to drive compared to some of the modern cars and more expensive cars. It, it, it's just a, a gentle feel to them. It's such an easy car to drive. It, there's, it, it looks as if it might be difficult, a powerful car to drive and everything like that. But it's an easy clutch. Mine's got a uh, synchro mesh on first. The early ones didn't have synchro mesh on first, so they were a bit, a bit more of a pig. But it's got synchro mesh on first. It's got independent rear suspension, there's no hard rides, um, and it does what you tell it to do. That there's no nasty little habits that you think, oh, you've got to watch this, or it does funny things, or uh, if you go too slowly, you have to change down quickly, or it runs roughly in traffic. It doesn't do any of those. It's just, it's an easy car for anybody to drive. And it's this reputation that has ensured that the E-Type Jaguar is a desirable car, even over 50 years after its first release. And for many, the pinnacle of this mechanical artwork is the drophead coupe. It's smooth, sleek, fast and elegant. These cars are not sheep in wolves' clothing. They are cheaters in tuxedos. And many will go out of their way to get hold of a good one. I went out in person wanting to buy it many years ago. I took it to the Grand Prix. They had the Jaguars, the E-Types with a soft top, driving the drivers around. And I drove around Alessandro Nanini at the time. He was a lovely chap. Yeah, anyway, while we're staying in the pits, some mechanic comes rushing up to me and says, look, Gerhard wants to buy your car. You know, how much went for a car? Gerhard wants to buy it. I'm thinking, oh, I haven't got time for this. And uh, so I told him a price and he disappeared and I never heard from him again. But I guess it must have been Gerhard Berger, I think. When, when he says Gerhard, how many Gerhard drivers are there? So I thought, oh, well. It showed interest, but he didn't buy it. I mean, I charged, I said probably twice as much as I paid for it, and he probably thought, I'm not paying this. When Helmut purchased his car 25 years ago, they were quite affordable. They increased in value through the mid-90s. Over the past few years, the price has crept up again, and a good restored drop head will fetch over 120,000 US, or over 70,000 pounds. Your challenge will be actually finding a good one for sale, as people generally hold on to them. So how well did you know your chrome? If you said it was a 1972 Lotus Europa Special, you'd be right. Built in the UK by Lotus, this special edition paid homage to the successful Lotus Formula One team of the day and their sponsor, John Player Special. These were the last Europas to roll off the factory floor before production ceased in 1975. Around 9,500 Europas were made. When you're out on the road, take a look around at just how many classic cars are still running and turning heads wherever they go. Like this classic Aston Martin. Or this very cool, sporty Austin Healey Roadster from yesteryear. It may take years of work, or years of loving care, but no matter how it gets there, a classic is a thing of motoring beauty, on the road or off. And you can see them here, on CC, Classic Cars.